So everybody, we start now lecture number five. The le this lecture is starting the modern physics by using all the tools that we developed in the previous lectures. Okay, the, this lecture will talk about Lorentz transformations. This is the main difference between classical and modern physics. And uh, we'll explain what are those transformations. And we'll see that by using this transformation, we can resolve some shortcomings that we found in Newtonian classical physics. And this is at the end of the lecture, we'll show you some even applications for devices that could be used by using these transformations. I repeat a few things that we have start, talked about earlier. Uh, we are talking about space-time transformations between inertial system because we spoke that laws of physics are based on relativity principle. We tells that the laws are the same in all inertial systems. So in order to use this law, we have to know how we transform in space-time from one inertial system to another. So the space-time transformation between inertial frames, so we have to pick up inertial frame, that means the way how we measure events, that means time and position of any event. So, and the transformation will translate you the measuring of the time and position in system prime indices to the one with unprime. The principle of relativity states that the laws of physics are the same in all inertial frames. So there is no preferred inertial frame. So L, this transformation, May, de may depend only on the relative motion between the frames, because all the frames are the same. So when we translate from one frame to the other one, the only thing which distinguishes between them is the relative motion between the system. Newton's first law tells you in an inertial frame, any object moves with constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. That means free motion are given constant velocity, or those are, this is called uniform motion, and is described by a straight walled line. In the space-time description, free motion is a straight line. Since uniform motion in one inertial frame is also uniform in the second one, space-time transformations between inertial frame map lines into line, and such maps are called affine maps. Those affine maps form a group, which is called Poincare group, and involving both translations and velocity transformation between frames. If frames have common origin, that means that time t and t prime zero, then the space origin was the same. That means the zero goes to zero. And often transformation when zero goes to zero is linear. So in this case, that's what we will discuss. We we'll discuss transformation between two inertial frames, which have the same origin at time zero, and therefore they are linear. So really what we mean is the following. We have two frames, a frame K here, and a frame K prime here. And we have some event, we get its coordinates and time in K prime, and T and X, Y, Z in frame K. K, V is the relative velocity between them. You see, I changed the axis, not in the usual configuration where x goes in the same direction as x prime, why I've done so, to make 
the configuration fully symmetric. Those two systems move like in the same way both sides. Is the this O prime, the origin of this system, moves in the negative x direction with respect to system K. Also, system K moves in the negative x prime direction with respect to K prime. That means both description, the relative motion is the same. What we gain, that means the transformation from here to here and from going backward will be the same under such choice of x. Now the transformation is linear, that means any linear transformation is given by a matrix, four by four matrix, uh, which we denote in this way. Why we write it in a lot of zeros? Because from the symmetry of the problem, we know that in the coordinates y and z, they are fully symmetric. Z and z prime doesn't, couldn't be that there would be a coefficient or something. Z prime must be z and y prime must be y. So we get those ones here. And the only change that could be only between the coordinates t and x, because in this direction there was a velocity. And therefore, those numbers are not defined a priori. So now let's see what are the consequences of the symmetry of the problem. The relativity principle tells you that there is a symmetry. All the systems are the same, that means the transformation from one to the other and the other to the first is the same. So let's write down. We have this transformation. We spoke only about t and x because for y, prime, y and z, it is trivial. So we have, we'll denote by L the matrix, two by two matrix, A, B, C, D, that we had earlier, and this matrix. and now what we know, let's try to understand what is this C. If we apply x prime zero, that means the origin in the moving system, then what we'll get, if I put here zero, we'll get uh, t equals a t prime and x equals c t prime. That means the velocity of the point O in frame K is x over t, which is c over a, t prime cancels out. That means we know that c, this c which is written here, is a times d. So that's only from the definition of the relative motion between the system. You know already this coefficient c. Now we use that this map, its inverse is the same as L, therefore L square is the identity. That means if you take this matrix and multiply it by itself, we have to get the identity matrix. What this leads us, if you write the, multiply the first row by the first column, you get A square plus A C, uh, A square plus B, C, but C is equal A, D. So we get A, D equals one, because it has to be one from here. When you log the position and the first row and the second column, multiply this by this, you'll get, in both cases, you have a B, and you get A plus D, we should be zero, etc. And this is all the four equations that we'll get for each entry of this identity matrix. Now, from the physics itself, t and t prime, uh, and we don't cannot have time reversal because causality tells you that a has to be the same everything which time interval positive in one system has to be positive in the other one. So A has to be positive. Now from 
equation, this one, a is positive, v is not zero, so d equals minus a. You already know that this d is minus a. Now you have c equals a, b, and d is minus a. We can take it outside the a and, and get a better form. But let's consider two cases. Consider first the case b equals zero. To we'll see later what does it mean if b equals zero. Look here, if b is zero, you get a square equals one. And if a square equals one, then a is positive, a equals one, and d is minus one. Write it down what it is, then you get t prime equals t, and uh, you get c equals a b, a is one, so you get x equal vt plus uh, you have minus x double because we inverted the axis. But those are exactly Galilean transformations. That means one of the possibilities is Galilean transformation. The other possibility, b is not zero. If b is not zero, then we'll define b tilde, we'll take outside the a, which is all the places around, and uh, here we'll get from an a equals we can get it for, from here, let's say. Yeah. And, ah, we write here a square b is equal to a b tilde. And so take out a square, you get a equals one of the square root, which is not zero, not one, because b tilde is not zero, and we divide it by something which is not one. So really, we have two possibilities. Either a is b is zero or a equals one. That means time is the same in all the system. <clears throat> the other possibility is if b is not zero, then the we cannot assume that the time in system k prime is the same as the time in system k. So let's see if this is a reasonable assumption or not. What is the meaning of A not equal one? That means that you are not Galilean. Is it a strange condition or it is a natural condition? So let's try to understand what does it mean. So we pick up, we are talking about the difference in timing. So we have to pick up a clock in system K place at the origin. And we have an event, the first event, the clock is at system K, position in X is zero, time at time T equals zero. We took another clock at a different point, at a distance X from this original clock, call this event B, and we picked up some kind way how to synchronize the two clocks. It's very important, but they are not at the same point. You have to be able to make them equal reading at the same time. For instance, you put in the middle some flight, uh, some light, and observe it in both places. And since it's in the middle, so you say that the time when it arrives has to be the same in both places. If one o'clock, if they don't show the same thing, so we change it to be the same. This is called synchronization of the clock. Now we have to consider another system, k prime, and we have to pick up a clock there. At the time zero, we synchronize them. This event, they are the same position, and k prime has also the event A, zero at zero, that was how we choose the two frames that they have common spatial zero, origin at time t equals zero. But this frame moves. So we let him move this clock together with uh, the system and it reached the position of clock B. He measures an event 
he looks what is the time of the, his clock that denoted t prime because he is in system k prime but he is still at the origin of the system he was not the system was moving with him now if you look what happened here he is the same position x as he was and but he is now observing a different time he's not synchronized to the this at time zero is measuring the time when this clock around here so what does it mean that a equals one a equals one tells you that the t prime and t should be the same question is why this clock measured only the time at the same clock between two times to really measure time to get to this t this event you have to synchronize the two clocks get a time zero and then another time when this clock arrived two different processes there's no a priori some physical reason why this should be the same but in galilean one this was an assumption and now we'll we'll not assume it and you see that this solves already a lot of problems so now we want to find this transformation in case two so as we are told that l has the following form we took a outside and a has this form and we have one and minus one because b was minus a here you have b and b tilde this is the form of the transformation in case two. the principle of relativity i remind you our velocities are the same in all inertial frames and you would like to have also you would be able to get some kind and variant metric under transformations l what is a metric measuring some distance between two events by euler lagrange if you have a, such a metric we will have an invariant evolution parameter which we missed if a is not one in classical mechanics we had the evolution parameter was time now t prime is not t so we cannot use it so as it was in classical mechanics and now we'll get another parameter based on this metric if we will be able to find a metric so we search for a metric but of a special form we want to keep that the space has all the directions the same so there has to be no difference from the from the euclidean metric on the spatial part but how we connect the time to the spatial part so we need two things the time is measured in hours seconds this uh, is measured in meters so you bring it to the same unit you have to multiply time by velocity so mu has units of velocity and we assume that it's not like euclidean metric but the difference if we strive with pluses it doesn't work out we'll not be able to get it but with minuses, it is possible to get. Mu, this mu may depend on the relative velocity between the system, k and k prime, because that's the only thing which distinguishes between the two systems. So now we want to find, is there an invariant metric between k and k prime? And what we, how we can find it. So, what we do we consider only between t and x because for y prime and z prime it will be automatically satisfied because there y prime is the same as dy dy prime dz is dz prime so there will be no problem so we only have to take care that the metric will act properly on those increments of, the, of time and in the x direction so we still have the connection that we we'll have to of a that we had earlier which was a equals one over square root one plus b tilde b okay so let's check what does it mean that the metric this 
will be remain invariant. That means if it's dx squared, we take mu squared dt squared minus dx squared. It has to be the same if you substitute dt, the expression from here, from the right, left right hand side, and for dx from the right hand side of this expression. Now, when we substitute a square, we have to square this term, and then the second term, and the product. So let's combine the terms we will have dt squared. So we get ones from here, and you get mu square a square dt square, it is prime square, and you get from here, you get a square v square dt square dt prime square. Now the cross terms, you get one cross term from here, which is this one, multiply mu dt, and so you get mu a a square b tilde and a cross term from here and it has twice minus of b plus and the last one with the x square it will be the square of this times mu square minus the square of this one which is a square now we want that this thing will be the same as mu square dt prime square, this term will disappear and this one will be one. So we have, if the metric is invariant, we have those three identities. The square, or the, uh, this bra uh, the bracket here has to be mu square. The, this bracket must vanish because we want to have no cross term dt dx dot, and the last term here has to be one. So let's see what does it, this mean. From here, you take a square outside and you get mu square minus b square because mu square, this is positive, a square is positive, so mu square minus b square has to be, must be positive. b square is less than mu square. Very interesting property. It means the velocities between the system cannot be arbitrary. They are limited by some speed mu. She didn't have in the classical mechanics, in classical physics, there's no limitation for velocity. Another thing from the second equation, from the second equation, a squared you can take out and cancel, two you cancel, and you get an equation for b tilde equals v over mu square minus. Now, this, from this equation, we can get also an equation for a. You get a squared, take it out, and you get mu square over mu square minus v square, divide by mu square, and you get a equal to square, one over the square root, one minus v square over mu square. Now, check this is consistent with this if you substitute this b which is written here you'll get v square over mu square exactly the same formula so two gives us the value for b that we tilde that we didn't knew till now and this is somehow related with the relative velocity and this constant mu that we didn't know what it is now if from this you get if with this b tilde you get all the three equations are satisfied this one and this one this one follows from the b tilde this one gives us the value for a and if we substitute it here and you get exactly a gives you the same formula for here so everything works out Perfectly, there is an invariant metric, and for the invariant metric, b tilde has to be equal to v over mu square, and the invariant metric will have this mu square in dt square minus dx square, dy square, dz square in general, and you put in also the y and z coordinates.
universality of the metric and the preserved speed. So we have this metric in both systems in the same, always, between any two events. So for instance, the R was here, the X, the R square is the X square plus the Y square plus the Z square. We have those, this equality. What does it mean when it is zero? When it is zero, it tells you if you divide it, the R, take it on the other side, divide it by the T square, you'll get the R dt is mu. That mu is a speed which is the same for both systems. In both systems, you'll get the same mu. That means there is a speed which is preserved from when you go from system K to system K prime. Very surprising because in generally when in classical physics, when you, one system is moving with respect to the other, the velocities add up, so there's nothing preserved. But if you are not Galilean, there is a speed preserved. Now let's check what happened if this preserved speed must be the same independent. In general, it may depend on the relative velocity between the system, V. Now, if you take three systems, we return to the general configuration where all the axes are parallel. And let's say K prime moves with velocity V with respect to K and mu V is preserved. And then we take another system K double prime, which moves with velocity V with respect to K prime in the same direction. And since the relative velocity between them is the same V, so also mu V is preserved. Now look from the system k to k prime, double prime. The relative velocity between them is already not v. It's almost twice as v. And still mu v is preserved. That means mu is preserved also from k to k prime, from k prime to k double prime, so from k to k double prime. That's what we will call a, the velocity addition between the two systems. So mu is the same also for the sum of the velocity. Now you can add three times and then you get half. So from such an argument, you get that mu is universal. That means if, you are, if the transformation in the nature are not Lorentz, uh, Galilean, and we know that they are not Galilean because we have shortcomings with this coming, coming from the classical physics. So we, there must be Lorentz and the, what we call this new transformation, I call the Lorentz transformation. And in this case, we have a universal speed which is preserved with yield on inertia, all inertia plane. The experiment show that such speed is the speed of light in vacuum C. So now we know everything about this transformation. We know the mu and uh, we know the full transformation. The mu is C and we substitute in uh, those transformations. So we get the well-known Lorentz transformation. If we know the transformation between space-time, we can now define how we translate velocities from one system to another. This is not velocity addition, it is called velocity addition. You see it's not commutative, it's, it is really composition because we, what we are talking is the following. Consider an object P with velocity U in system K prime. So if we start it at the origin, at the time t equals zero. So its wall line is t prime, the time, and u times t prime. That means it is t prime, u1 t prime, u2 t prime, u3 t prime, in k. In k prime, now let k prime move with velocity v in the x direction. That means v has the, the, its value v and zero, zero with respect to k. What we denote by v plus u, 
O plus, that's Einstein's velocity addition, is the velocity of this object P in K. That means the object moves with velocity U, here is the velocity in the system, the moving system, V is the relative velocity of the system, and the sum represents the velocity of the object in my system plane. So let's do this calculation, what it is. For this, we have to check how the space-time, this world line is translated into x, y, z, t, x, y, z. We use the Lorentz transformation. We had the gamma factor A, we wrote it down explicitly here. We have uh, A, t prime, and this is B tilde, which was, now became this one. And all uh, substitute in the matrix, and what we got is this expression. Now look, the, this is the t, x, and y, z of our world line of the, our object. What is the v, o plus u? v, o plus u, that means it's the velocity of this object in our system k. That means it is x, y, z over t. This is a line. You see, t prime can be taken out and everything is multiplied by t prime. That means it's proportional to some vector, it's a straight line, and the velocity on this straight line is the coordinate, the spatial coordinate divided by the time. When we divide by the time, t prime will cancel out all the places, so we get gamma outside, one plus v u one over c square, and what we get in the numerator? You get t prime cancels out, you get gamma outside, v plus u1 for the coordinate x. For the coordinate y, you get u2 and u3 for the coordinate z. This gives us the following formula for velocity addition or composition, v plus u. We can divide by gamma the numerator and denominator. So in denominator, what you will get? In general, you get this expression. You get one plus, what is u1? U, v u1 is exactly the dot product of v with u. v is this vector and u is this vector. When you take the dot product, you get v times u1, the regular dot product in Euclidean space. So you get v dot product with u over c square. In the numerator, we divide it by gamma. So here we get v plus u, the component of u, parallel to v. But we divide it by gamma, so we'll pick up this part, u2 and u3, the perpendicular part to the v, picks up the gamma minus 1. This is the new formula for velocity addition from relativity. Very interesting formula with a lot of consequences change our understanding. First of all, it's not commutative. You see U and V come in totally different way. And uh, only if there's no, if they are parallel, then it's symmetric. Then, okay, let's consider, for instance, let's assume that you have a source of light in system k prime, which moves with the, the light moves with the velocity c, as we said. So how it will be observed in system k? So we could, we'll consider two cases when two to the velocity b, even with minus b, the same time. So in, since it's only parallel, moving in the same direction of x. So there's no perpendicular component, you'll get v plus c plus minus, and the denominator you get one plus minus v dot u, since it's there in the same direction, so you get v times c of c squared. Now look what we get, to x c squared, um, uh, you cancel one c out, you get v times c, and you take c plus minus v, and take it on the top, and you'll get it will always be C. 
the mean, the speed of light is independent of the speed of the source. In system K prime, the source was at rest. In our system K, K the source is moving either with velocity V or with minus V. But the light moves with the same speed C. This is resolving the first shortcoming, uh, which was explained by Michelson Morley experiment. So we have resolved the first uh, shortcoming of Newtonian dynamics. We also resolved, by the way, the shortcoming coming from the difference of the laws of physics for electromagnetic field and mechanics. Because we say now that the transformations are always the Lorentz one, as observed in, uh, in Maxwell equations, which are invariant under the Lorentz transformation. That's how they were found in the first time. So two shortcomings are resolved. Now we'll go to the third one, which was Fizeau experiment of 1851, where they tried to measure the velocity of light in moving water. So they had a source and a detector and splitting the light into two directions and the water was circulating once it was going in the direction of the light and the other arm it was going opposite to the direction that goes here and the velocity the light goes here and it's observed from the detector and we able to get understand what is the difference between the two uh, arriving of the light from so by going the upper path and the lower path so here uh, is all measure the relative speed of light in moving water now if the water would be stationary before you start to move the water, the, in stationary water, the speed of light is C over N, where N for water is 1.33, the index of the fraction of water. This is the speed of light in water. It is not the C, it's slightly lower. Now, what the predicted speed of light in arm plus when it, it uh, was the speed of the in the arm plus the speed of the water and in the other arm is different this one but we found that's not the case we found that the speed in this arm for instance is the following the speed of light is okay but the v is not the full v it is one minus one over n squared times. So it's n squared is about two. Uh, so we we'll get the half of the speed of the moving water is influencing the speed of light. That was the big surprising result for a long time until it was solved by Einstein in 1905. And you don't need too much, you need only the velocity addition that we had till now. Look what, how it works. Uh, we want to check what is W plus. That means you have to add in this arm, if you take the system which moves together with the water, then in this system, the water is stationary, and the speed is c over n. Now the, the system itself moves with velocity v. Now how, what is the system, what is the speed of the, water, the light with respect to us is exactly the velocity addition. We have a system moving together with the water. We know the speed in this system we want to find in our left. Now we substitute in the formula that we get there, we get V plus C over N because there's no perpendicular part, both the velocity, the light and the V is in the same direction. And the numerator here, one plus the product of them over NC squared. 
uh, c over n times v over c squared. Now c and c squared are cancelled, and you get this expression. Now, what you do, you expand this uh, because c is a relatively large number. So the denominator is approximately one, one plus some small number. Now, look what we'll get we, when we expand such things. We write the, the denominator, we can write approximately one minus this thing because it's the denominator. So that's what we have written, the numerator minus the numerator times this term. Now let's check what we get. We get c over n, we have it. Then we have a v. Now this term, the first term, v squared over nc, is still small because c is large, and v is small, and n is approximately 1. The only term which will survive is this one, because c and c will cancel out. We will get v over n squared. We have another v. So you take it out of the outside and you get 1 minus 1 over n squared, exactly the formula that was observed by Pizzoli. So really, you resolve the problem as of the third shortcoming only by identifying that the real space-time transformation between inertia frames are the Lorentz transformation. And I want to show you another interesting uh, way how to use this transformation, which is needed to for a device that we mentioned already, an optical gyroscope. So we'll explain you how it works. It is called fiber optic gyroscope. It's built up on Sagnac effect. And you show that this to understand the Sagnac effect, you don't need more than the velocity addition, the right one. So how it is built up this device? You have some uh, base uh, table. On this table, you have a light source, which got split and sent into fiber optics, two fiber optics. One goes clockwise and the other one counterclockwise. So when it goes through the two fibers, the fibers are, must be very, very the same, made exactly of the same fiber and the same lens. And when they made the light went through the two fibers, it comes back to some point and goes to the detector. That's the, that is the device. The salient effect is a phenomenon encountered in interferometry that is elicited by rotation. That means if this table will rotate, you will get a way how to measure its rotation. So how it is done? As I told you, we have two beams going in. in uh, which we are split at the same beam. A beam is a wave. A wave has a phase. And you, if the effect measures the difference of phases by passing the two directions, one clockwise and the other one counterclockwise. That means it is the following. You have a one beam. And if the other one is shifted, by the phase, when you add them together, you get a pattern depending on the shift between the two beams. So we have to define the phase velocity. That means fix on your sine curve at some point. And look how this curve propagates with the speed. This is called the phase velocity. And we denote this phase velocity Vp, the speed of the phase propagation in a fiber at rest in some inertial system. So you have the fiber, you send in a light and a long fiber, and you see when it reaches the other side, you get the velocity of the phase, uh, which is independent on the bending of the fiber. The photon, when it lives in a fiber, it doesn't know about the world around him. 
his volt in the fiber and he propagates with the speed dp which is less than the speed of light the phase velocity or in the fiber depending on the fiber and the wavelengths of the source there is also the fiber itself when it is rotating it picks up a velocity when you have a circle and the circle is rotating so you have an angular velocity uh, which is equal to the radius of this device time omega this is r omega gives you the velocity of the rotating fiber of radius r and omega is the rotating frequency so the picture looks as follows let the light enter at a go through the fiber and reaches the exit point b the fiber itself has a velocity vr with respect to our inertial frame inertial frame is the non-rotating one in which we do all our measurements we remember we enter a we go to b and we want and the velocity of the fiber is vr now if you want to understand what is the velocity of the light in our frame so we know the velocity in the moving frame which is moving the vr uh, which is the is the vp and in our frame it will be vr o plus vp that's what we get the velocity of this p naught of this space in k is vr o vp now both of them are in the same direction so once more you have the usual formula in the other fiber which moves is counterclockwise the velocity is negative minus vr and you'll get another formula which is written here so the whole difference is here the minus now we want to find the relative velocity of v naught with respect to b the exit point how close it gets to the end of the fiber but the exit point has a velocity what is its velocity the same as velocity of the fiber we are the relative velocity is a regular difference because we are talking about two velocities at the same reference frame in k so the inside the k that's not velocity addition which is quite people mixing Velocity addition is when you have a velocity in one moving frame and you want to translate it to the other one. Here we're talking about two velocities at the same frame. The relative velocity is the difference. So we subtract from V plus VR. Now, if you must subtract VR, so we'll get VR times one, which will cancel out this VR, and you'll get only term, and here you'll get VR square, and VP will be common. So I take out VP and I got in the numerator. 1 minus vr square over c square and the denominator is the same denominator now for the other fiber it is moving with velocity minus vr uh, so you get v minus 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 vr so it will be plus vr and once more the vr will cancel so you get the same denominator numerator the same, and the denominator has on a different side here Next thing, what we have to find, what is the difference in time that it will take to light go through fiber one and two? The time that it takes you is the length of the fiber divided by the velocity. The velocity when the phase and reaches the end point B. So it will be L over V1 for T1 and L over V2 for T2. When we divide by V1 and V2, the numerator goes in the denominator, and which is the same, so we we'll get it the same. And we have to subtract from this one, this one. One will cancel, and you'll get only an L is the common VR uh, VP over C squared this expression okay now what turns out very interesting vp in both cases once enumerated denominated it cancels 
So we got an interesting formula. We got that the delta t is independent on the velocity of light in the fiber. That means if you change the fiber to a different fiber with different phase velocity, the effect will not be influenced. Very surprising thing for people that work there because everybody was sure that it was depending on the velocity of the light in the fiber. It's independent because it's purely relativistic effect. Now, what we'll get, we'll get L D uh, two times L times the relative velocity of the fiber VR of a C square, and the denominator is exactly the gamma square of the relative velocity. Okay, now let's the length uh, of the fiber since it is moving with velocity vr so the translation of the length picks up this gamma minus one the time t time now why are we doing about t time because really he will measure the difference will be measured on the same rotating system so everything will be measured in the system k prime so t prime is related delta t was gamma t prime and delta t prime is gamma minus one delta t those gamma two gamma one minus one will cancel this gamma square and um, so delta t prime will be this expression two pi a from here r here r v vr is r omega so get r of square omega over c square now if the phase the phase difference is depending on also on the beam frequency the beam frequency is omega so you have to multiply omega delta t prime and you get an omega now this expression pi r square is the area of between the fiber and so we have four s omega over c square this is exactly gives you exactly when this one you can measure so you know what is omega and everything you know here so this gives you a very very accurate measurement of the angular velocity of a rotating system it's very important uh, effect and it's very useful the reference of, for this part of lecture is built on the lecture we have built on the two papers and on the book and that I published in 2005 and the paper published this year the last year in journal symmetry okay that's for today thank you bye -bye. thank you bye, bye everyone bye everyone bye, bye.